I'll be talking to you about the development of all of all our models that um, we produced in our um, fume project. That's where we have to point it. I'll take this one. Um, so yeah, we have three different models on three different spatial scales. We have a global model for international migration flows, a regional model, and a local model. And they feed into each other from the global model to the regional model and to the local model. All of them have been developed by different teams, different institutes. I was working on the global model. I try to give you a brief overview about the other two as well. But if you have questions, there are experts in the audience that you can ask questions later on as well. So let's just straight jump ahead into the global model. So the global population slash migration model is based on the cohort component model that was developed at YASA quite some years ago that already was quite successful at projecting populations for the coming decades. Just to sum up what we used as a baseline, we take a, popu a population um, stock is considered um, and one estimates a set of mortality rates, a set of education transition rates, some kind of migration component and fertility rates. These are then applied consecutively to the population stocks until one reaches the end of the projection time. It is a cohort component model because the population is distributed into different age cohorts, different education cohorts, sex, as well as country of birth and country of origin. Since we're talking about migration, the focus will obviously be this migration component. What was done previously in this cohort component model is that, on, that there was a set of migration rates that's been estimated using past migration trends. So the problem with that is that they can't really communicate with the rest of the model. They've been estimated in the beginning and then will be applied every time step. So if, for example, a diaspora um, community changes, this, these rates are not necessarily able to account for that. So our idea in the few model was to develop a dynamic model that interacts with the rest of the population model. We use two equations that have also been previously developed at our Potsdam Institute of Climate Impact Research, and they account for emigration, transit migration, and return migration. The small letters M denote the migration rates and the indices denote the dimensions that we're using. Um, since we're using immigration trends, migration, return migration, we definitely use place of birth, place of residence and destination. And the novel part about this model was the skill cohort and the age cohort that were necessary in order to couple it with the global population model. Unfortunately, we had to shrink down these cohorts. We only use three age cohorts, one for young, young people aged 0 to 24, one for persons in the working age 24 to 25 to 64, and one for potentially retired persons, which are 65 plus years. Also, we only use two skill cohorts, one for high skill, um, which is upper secondary education or higher, and one is low skill. So now I said, okay, we're developing this model. I didn't actually show you what's inside the model. That comes now. We have these two equations. I'm not going to go very deep into how they work, but what I do want to show you is what are the drivers, what is determining if a person moves and what the magnitude of a migration flow is. And we have three important parts going from right to the left. We start with a relative diaspora, which basically leads to the fact that if there's an um, existing migration community in some destination country, this country will be more attractive to migrants from this place of birth, list, this place of residence. Furthermore, we account for economic factors through a wage rate ratio, which is um, education specific, um, leading to the capability of the model that a migrant can compare. Do I have any financial benefits if I move to that residence? Will my wage rise or not? And the last part is something that's called an origin GDP function. What it is and how it looks is shown here. So it basically 
gives you a mobility based on a GDP per capita. If you look at that on the Y axis, you have the mobility slash migration on the X axis, you have the GDP per capita. And you can see that for low GDPs, we have a low mobility as well as for high GDPs, we have a low mobility as well. For the low GDPs, that's caused by the fact that there might be an incentive for a person to move, but not necessarily the financial means. Whereas on the other hand of the spectrum, richer countries, the financial means do exist, but the incentive is not there because you're already living at the upper end of that spectrum. Therefore, the highest mobility is assumed to be found for intermediate GDP countries. So that's basically how the model is set up. And what's the nice and novel part about this model is, first of all, we can use different demographic scenarios that go into the population model. So one can tweak the fertility rates, mortality rates, make assumption on how they change. And now our migration model will actually respond to those. For example, if a diaspora changes, if there's like a lot of persons coming to one destination, our migration model will respond to that at every time step. And the second part is that we can feed economic scenarios in, times, in terms of GDP projections into our wages, into our GDP dependent mobilities. So it's very easy to like just create a scenario where you have shocks in different regions or where you have just like some economic assumptions and have a look at what that means in terms of migration. So that's it for the global model. We're now gonna take a look at the regional model, which has been executed in four countries. We have Denmark, um, Netherlands, Italy, and Poland. And what this model does, it basically connects, can I move that? Yeah. Um, what it, it connects the global international model with the local model, and it deploys a bidirectional model. So we only have two components, which are on one hand, the cities or metropolitan areas that are later on used in the local model, and on the other hand, the rest of the country. Those are then divided into age, sex, migration status, and education. The migration status varies um, a little bit um, depending on the definition by the National Statistic Institute. And how the model works is it takes um, micro register data from um, the National Statistic Institute, um, estimates a population for 2020 and, hang on, sorry, divides this population into this city component, the rest of the component applies the population decreasing part, which is mortality and emigration, again, based on the nas national statistic data. And the emigration data is additionally in accordance with our global results from the international migration model. Afterwards, we apply the international uh, internal migration part, which again, only works between both these components, city and the rest. And finally, we have the um, population increasing part, which is uh, consisting of fertility slash birth, and again, the immigration that is um, in accordance with our global results. So that's for the regional model. And now let's move. Oh, actually, like the output, sorry, of this regional model is then population projections depending on origin country. So it we can look at different mig uh, migrant communities in, for example, Copenhagen, and all of that is um, produced in a NUTS 3 level. And now to the local model. So the last layer of our three model um, project here. We look at three different cities. One is Copenhagen, Amsterdam, Warsaw, and Rome. And what um, what the model is based on, it's not so much a migration model or a population model as we've seen before. So there's no changes in uh, due to fertility, migration, or uh, mortality, but it rather disaggregates the results that have been produced by the regional model before. And it 
uses the data that you've just seen and from the regional model plus development plans for or like development plans for the future of the city those might include um projects of um, housing public transportation or um, emerging branches in industry all of these things that might impact the growth and the um, aggregation of migrant groups in a city and it deploys a machine learning approach um, using a convolutional neural network but that's also the most technical i'll get to that model and what it actually produces is a 100 meter grid cell map of each of those cities where um, one can look at the different migrant communities depending on country of origin and for the last part of this presentation i'm just going to briefly guide you through how this model works or like what's the concept of the model we start with aggregated loop data which is on the nuts three level from the regional model and produce an initial estimate we're by disaggregating it, using it, um, using global human settlement data, um, which includes the inf well, no po a population grid from global human settlement, including information on migrant um, population. So each of those initial estimates here is done for one migrant community. This then feeds into the refinement part of the model where there's um, several iterations um, for those, for those um, yeah, using this initial estimates and also accounting for the ancillary data with that, which then again includes this development plans arriving at a final estimate for this one time step produced by the regional model. Um, so that's it from my side. I hope you could take some of that with you and yeah, looking forward to questions. So what I'm going to talk about today is really um, some approaches uh, we are trying to develop. We haven't really developed yet. Uh, some approaches to make predictions and forecasts of uh, uh, migration. Uh, I make the title called From Traditional to New Approach. Uh, the reason I make that title is because uh, from last session, we've heard a lot of new data sources, right? Um, so in some way, once we have new data, different type of data sources, perhaps migration models will need to adapt a little bit. Another reason I make this title is because uh, traditionally migration models are developed for the purpose of explaining patterns, explaining why people move from A to B. But now we are kind of given the task to make, you know, what's going to happen in the future in the next year or next month. So the purpose has shifted a little bit in the field, which might require a different approach uh, to, to model migration patterns. So as I said, traditionally, uh, I mean, migration models existed since basically late 1800, right? We know uh, Ravistan's model, which is a very simple gravity model using population size between A to B, and then the distance between A to B as a model to kind of explain why people move. <clears throat> it's a simple mechanic, mechanic, mechanic stick model. And then recent decades, uh, there has been some significant uh, improvement in terms of incorporating more uh, migrant behavior, incentives, uh, migration costs, so, and then economists are trying to, you know, model migration behavior within uh, a, a theoretical framework called random utility framework. So this line of research has kind of evolved quite substantially and there are a, a various forms of uh, migration models has been published uh, in the uh, literature. Now, until recently, I think this is, uh, some colleagues from Fume, uh, Jacob, uh, uh, Jacob Schwer, yeah. Um, so he basically wrote an article criticized, basically saying those models, they don't predict and they don't even explain migration behavior. So it's very uh, blunt criticism to this traditional class of model. And then, uh, yeah, Jakus and colleagues uh, uh, published an article last year the starting sentence is uh, basically uh, the models doesn't work. Uh, 
you know, all the models expose significant shortcomings uh, during the uh, period 2015-16. So that's why we three projects are together, uh, you know, doing something hopefully which can be more useful. And few, uh, well, I kind of connect, try to connect three projects together. So I just elaborate one publication from each project. So FUM, uh, obviously, uh, uh, they were very much focused on, at least for the global model, I realized they are very much focused on modeling, capturing the dynamics, right? Temporal dynamics. Uh, Quant make from the published literature, I know uh, Jaco, Jack Hoop and uh, colleagues publish a paper about early warning system in IMR. I'm sure both projects has way more uh, uh, papers, working papers or deliverables uh, already out there. Hummingbird, as Albert elaborated in the last session, we've produced a lot of data, um, but we don't have a model yet to make any forecasts or prediction. Uh, we are still in the process trying to reconcile different kinds of data, mobile phone data, satellite data, and social media data. First trying to align them together and then uh, try to uh, feed them in the model. So today we don't really have, I don't really have a model to present how we're gonna you know, make forecasts based on, but we did some exercise. Uh, we did something I called model experiments. Um, so we did some model experiments. What, I, what we did is we are trying to evaluate, uh, you know, it's not different models, but it's kind of different classes of models from very basic, simple, traditional model. When we have migration data, we just treat them as a cross-sectional data, for instance, a snapshot, right? And we are trying to model, given a given point in time, how people move from, uh, you know, point A to point B. And then the second model, uh, so the, 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 the first model, we call that pooled model. The second model is, we call autoregressive model. So we are trying to add some element to the model, which is, you know, the migration rates from previous period. So we are arguing that, okay, today's migration uh, outcome may be dependent on uh, previous period. The third model, which is uh, the model that has been kind of developed since around 2010, 2011, uh, which is adding uh, flow fixed effects. So meaning that in the model, because we, now we have panel data, right? We have all the uh, panels, I'm uh, sorry, we have uh, people moving from A to B, and then we have the variation over time, which allows the modeler to control for some diet specific effects such as uh, language, distance, uh, you know, uh, all those kind of things that are not changing over time or change very little over time. And the last model is something we are trying to test is uh, making the model even more complex, uh, more and less restricted in terms of we're arguing that, okay, uh, migration response to economic shocks, to climate shocks, to, you know, conflict of violence that might not be necessarily uniform across all the diet. It might be, you know, some countries might have, you know, positive response, some countries might have negative response. So this is idea behind the last model uh, we call FD, FTG. Yeah, so there's another distinction when we do this exercise. So. As I said, traditionally, in, in the traditional model, uh, we have traditional data, which tend to have a short time span. So we might have like five, six years. And so today, I think most Eurostat data, maybe you can have about 10 years or 12 years uh, length. So in the first exercise, we are trying to see, you know, how these different models will perform in the data where, you know, the, the, the panel is relatively short. So, this is how this, we use a cross-validation uh, technique there. And this is how we split the data. Basically, we use the yellow part of the data as kind of the data to, to train our model. And then the, 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 the darker color as a, 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 a validation uh, uh, data. We are just trying to compare how the migration predicted by the yellow part of the data 
match with the dark color of the data. So now in that approach, because the, the panel is very short, we cannot test our FTG model. Uh, we can only test the first three models. So we test the pool model, uh, AR model, and fixed effect model. And what we found is that the training model, so when we compare you know, the prediction from the training with the training, actual training, uh, actual uh, uh, migration outcome in the training, we see that there is clear improvement. When we have the pooled model, the performance is worse. And then when we move on adding a autoregressive component, the improvement has improved. And then we add fixed effects, uh, there's a little bit uh, improvement in there. But when we look at the testing data, uh, there's a, uh, a kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, inverse U shape, right? We start from pool model, which still remain poor performance. And then if, if we move on to the AR model, it tend to maintain the performance level, but the fixed effects just lose the predictive uh, power. So this is uh, one, uh, one insights we get from the from this exercise. The second test we are trying to uh, think about if we if we have a long panel and how the model performance will differ depending on the length of the training data we have. So if we have a shorter training data, would that give us the same results as a longer uh, training data? Now, in this exercise, we compare fixed effects and our FTG model. And what we found is that in the FE, uh, fixed effect model, which is the, the, the left-hand side of the two panels, which is the kind of the model, popular models uh, in the last decade, uh, when you add the, the, the training performance uh, is not improving much, when, even when you add like GDP or other uh, time varying covariates. But when you look at the test performance, it actually shows when the panel gets longer, FTG model will become uh, less and less predictable because the arrow is going up. But when we look at the uh, FTG model, initial period when we have a very short panel, the arrow, the, 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 the testing arrow is very, very bad, right? It goes very, very high. But when we increase the length of the training data, the performance trying to, it, it kind of diminish quite, oh, sorry, the errors diminish quite uh, sharply, which means the performance actually improved quite substantially when the data, when the training data length uh, becomes uh, longer. So the short conclusion here is just uh, in the short panel data, so far what we found is uh, the AR, the autoregressive model, which is actually a quite simple uh, model, uh, tend to be quite balanced in the way, uh, in terms of uh, bias variance trade-off. Uh, in the longer panel data, uh, we realized that FTG model actually can perform, uh, can outperform the fixed effect model that is in, has been quite popular in the literature uh, so far. So the implication of this is that if we are going to rely more on Big data. Big data tend to have a much higher frequency. It can be daily, weekly, or monthly. Then perhaps we can gradually shift towards FTG model uh, rather than uh, the uh, fixed fix effect model. Now, the second point I want to make is also the purpose is different, right? Because uh, initially, when those fixed effects model were developed, they were trying to understand, for instance, how strong the GDP. Uh, uh, variation across countries can explain the variation in migration patterns. But nowadays, perhaps we have a different purpose. We want to you know, have something which can make more uh, accurate predictions. And therefore, I feel there's my, there might be a, a shift uh, in terms of you know, uh, the modeling uh, concept. Thank you very much. Now welcome to take over. Thank you. So I'd like to, to wrap up this session by talking a bit about how we uh, were dealing with migration uncertainty in 
in quantum ink, joint work with, with Emily Barker, who did most of the empirical work. But first, going back to the current, to the to the motivation, you know, the, the, the Ukraine war has uh, actually uh, shaped the way we were thinking and uh, about also about methodological developments. And the fact that we were faced with nearly up unprecedented displacement in terms of intensity, in terms of numbers, in terms of policy response, you know, the, the, the EU response, for all, for all its uh, issues has been phenomenal and, uh, compared to what, what might have been expected. Leaving us with questions, what can we know? What do we know and what can we know about the future and what can be reasonably predicted? And in a sense, how, how the work evolved was, was of course starting from, the, from, from reviewing the state of the art, from doing a uh, a typology. Some of you have already seen it. Uh, apologies to 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 those of you who have, but a typology of the of the types of uncertainty, especially with focus on those aspects that are knowable, reducible, and those that are not. So we are we are really trying to see if there is if there are meaningful statements that we can make about the future that can help us reduce the uncertainty at least a bit and make it more manageable through applying more knowledge about the you know not only concepts and definitions as we discussed in the last session and data and measures but also what's uh, what's uh, driving migration how this may develop uh, next so challenges of migration measurement are we've already discussed so I'll, I'll just gloss over that moving on to the review of the state of the art so actually the the, the field of migration modeling literature has become richer and richer over the over the past uh, especially two decades and there, there are increasingly more and more approaches around not all of them are, are successful but uh, Basically, when, when you look at what's available out there in terms of methodology, you can, you can see that there are three, three strands of uh, methods that are typically used. One, those that are really tailored for now casting and very short term forecast predictions. So these are typically the signal uh, detection or, or change point detection models, early warnings. And this is something that at the at the user end is is really important for the for the very operational needs such as you know humanitarian response resource allocation and so on. Then we have the statistical and econometric models as well as a bunch of expert based approaches surveys which aim at forecasting proper in a horizon of a few years ahead so so we can we can say okay it's a short to perhaps to mid term planning so more a tactical level. And then finally, we've got scenarios. So with scenarios, we are looking a few decades ahead, possibly, and they can be either expert-based, which is the, the, the norm, or in some cases, in some rare cases, they can be model-based. So this is something that really is used to elucidate long-term strategic thinking and planning. And of course, as you appreciate, as we go through the, through the horizons, as we extend the horizons, uncertainty vastly increases. So what what have we what have we done and what has been done uh, in terms of early warnings and forecasts especially? So early warning models uh, trying to identify that and detect the change in trends in in real time or in near real time. So this was spurred by the by the work uh, with with colleagues that 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 was really background work to the to the quantum efforts. Just looking at the asylum application data and when changes in the, the trends of those may trigger some some alarms, and this is something that has has also been uh, extended in many ways by by the work done by by Stefano and and Marcello Caramia and, and Teddy Wilkin in the paper in in Scientific Reports last year when they added a lot of information from new data of different times, such as uh, the GDEL database, uh, of which in a moment, Google Trends, which was also another approach that we did uh, try to pursue. So going back to the, to the Ukrainian case study, so one, one question that we had, and in, indeed in, in Quantumic, uh, in one of the reports, we have tested the, the Ukrainian as well as Syrian examples, just to see if there, could have been any sensible predictive 
signal of at least a few months ahead that, that something uh, is about to happen in terms of uh, asylum uh, asylum um, related migration so so in a, in economic parlance this was a search for leading indicators leading in time and leading events both across a range of of more <laughs> novel or not so novel and and more traditional data such as macroeconomic data on, on exchange rate and trade relationships and one one important uh, element that we found is that the, the the databases such as GDEL, so global database of event events language and tone, includes some interesting insights from the uh, analysis of the tone of the dominating narrative and and discourse. So, so there is that we were able to find some predictive signal there. Uh, interestingly, the signal was was the strongest when coupled with uh, some macroeconomic indicators such as exchange rates. And the best we could do is is actually to have some some uh, about three months lead in time for 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 Ukraine, uh, similar kind of uh, horizon for 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 Syria, and. Uh, what you have on the slide is an example of a model that wasn't for, for Ukraine that wasn't entirely successful. So it was overreacting for most of the period since since the the Orange Revolution and the the, the Euromaidan, and didn't quite didn't quite get any indications of things that might go wrong towards the end of 2021 and uh, early 2022. But but then if you if you look at the uh, discourse if you look at the the number of media mentions with sort of negative tone and with with tone indicating that something might be going on then then you can actually see that the the peaks are kind of in the right places and you can see that that starting from late 2021 especially as we go into early 2022 we have we have a very high spike uh, in in terms of the measures that could possibly be used in the early warning setting, so the the, the only the, the another thing that we found was uh, that was quite quite interesting and quite important is that, however you define the threshold of uh, triggering an alarm or you know indicate or in other words. You know, it's not the best word, but you know, in the literature, it's 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 basically called crisis events. So I'll I'll stick to that for the sake of the argument. So what? How do you define a crisis event, or how do you define a high impact event? Is uh, something that the models and modeling uh, approaches are also very sensitive to. So this is one thing. Uh, another perspective. So once we start looking into forecasts, of course, the time series models uh, are quite uh, predominant in the in the literature. Not not surprising because that's the the, the purpose of their existence. And that 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 hadong that you found uh, uh, autoregressive models uh, to be to be actually quite uh, you know, one of the top performing, especially for shorter data series, doesn't surprise me at all. I mean, this goes back to, to the work we did with Arek Wisniewski about you know, a decade and a half ago, when, when we also found that a theoretical model such as autoregression time series approaches uh, are actually uh, beating all the contenders pretty much hands down. But, the, there is a nuance here, which is that uh, for different flows, different mo models and different methods may be more appropriate, just because different flows have different characteristics and different levels of predictability or unpredictability. So, so be, be careful what, what you're using for, for which uh, flow. And by the way, this is an additional argument for disaggregating flows as much as you can to the to 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 hopefully work with distinct categories uh, groups of migrants or distinct categories of flows which will differ in terms of predictability and hence uh, implying different approaches uh, to use so what we did in quantum we did uh, we did quite a lot of work on structural models so uh, based on vector autoregression uh, so multidimensional time series where migration would be predicted together with all sorts of explanatory variables in, in a single model with some structure imposed on it, which answers the question of how to predict the predictors if you are going to use them. 
And again, unsurprisingly, and again in line with uh, with the results back from the from the early 2010s, this is something that comes with very large levels of forecast uncertainty. So it's it's good in a short term, but uh, not beyond a few years ahead. But what these models allow you is these kind of models estimated on a panel of uh, panel of uh, indicators allow you to to analyze their responses to different to changes in different variables or to shocks, as we would again, perhaps not not uh, the best choice of a word, but that's uh, that's the that's the literature standard in economics where this is coming from. So we can we can see how much an increase or a decrease in migration or in other variables, how it propagates through the through the through the model, and what responses can we expect in different parts of the system and this is important for for the scenario generation aspect because this is one way in which we can construct coherent what if scenarios and this is also one way in which when we think about stress testing different policy solutions that's one way of that's one way of doing this another way of doing this which is uh, more theoretical so var, var models can range from from a theoretical completely to somewhat theoretically inf informed another way of of looking at it would be to to actually try to build a theoretical model so what we did look at um, with with emily in the context of the quantum work was what's being done in macroeconomics uh, central banking and similar area uh, similar areas is to look at what's called the dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models which are very vast models with with uh, you know, in excess of hundreds of, of of equations some at the macro level some at the micro level which can be partially calibrated to available empirical data uh, for example through applying the vector or progressive framework so there is a this is a way of describing the problem in a very formal way uh, in a in an approach that connects the macro level dynamics and the micro level decisions at the theoretical uh, and in, in its theoretical layer but of course what you get is is something that's very close to a black box it's very complex it's it's difficult to construct and interpret and quite crucially it's not something that is in our case in the case of migration that can be used in a predictive uh, sense because the uncertainty at the end of it would be would be absolutely overpowering so what we can do is instead again go back to the go back to the scenarios knowing that migration is one of the most uncertain population processes for the for the reasons that we already discussed if you've got underpinning it decisions of various actors many interacting drivers and driver environments large uncertainty most of it especially in the long run unknowable at the present there are very natural limits to what predictive models can tell you so here the role of scenarios comes to the fore and scenarios can be used for a variety of purposes but but i think i would uh, i would highlight the, the contingency planning and stress testing and similar because in a way this is one of the key purposes of building those and um, building those uh, forward-looking migration trajectory is to, to try to make sure that whatever decisions are made today are robust. And there is another twist, is that the whatever we produce, uh, we, we hope that will be used by someone. And to that end, we need to manage the user's expectations very clearly and to be very explicit that some of the uncertainty is indeed irreducible. And the further into the future you go, the more of it uh, is of that nature. So that brings me to the to the reactions uh, to, to to uncertainty and 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 complexity, which is uh, part of the work that we'll also be coming back uh, after coffee in the in the session on scenarios and in the session on on communication and uh, and ethics. You can't ignore uncertainty, right? That that would be something that not only is sort of remnant of the 19th century deterministic uh, hubris of um, of some of the some of the social scientists, but also at the policy side, gives the illusion of control. So it gives the the impression that that policymakers are in control of things, uh, in which in case they really aren't. 
ignoring the fact that things are complex at the same time can lead to proposing solutions that are unlikely to be effective and are likely to cause unintended consequences. And you know, the, the, there are many examples of that. Take your pick. But what we have is that, that we have both in migration and migration research and in migration policies, we have a few examples of at least start of thinking about uncertainty and procedures and processes for, for dealing with that. So the EU blueprint is a, uh, is a special, especially important uh, case uh, in that regard. Still, it's the case that when we look at the policy developments, is the reactive that dominates rather than, than more proactive perspectives, although there is a slight shift. And, and our hope is that through the tools and models that, that we have been developing and, and the other of the, the rest of the community has been developing, we can help shift the perspectives as long as the, uh, the models and the tools and the results are properly communicated and more of it uh, after, copy, after coffee. And with that, uh, I think it's uh, five to four in Brussels now. So I think it's time uh, I say thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. We, I have a proposal actually, uh, since uh, we would like to discuss it and there's a lot of reflection. So like if uh, anyone wants really coffee, just take it, but come back, but not massively. So let's continue the discussion. Yes, or you can even sit there and open the microphone. Yes, so welcome to the panel. So very interesting presentation. Thanks a lot to the, the speakers. So let me just summarize I mean, what I've taken from, from these presentations. Essentially, the important thing is that, uh, as was said in, in the previous section, no model is correct, like no data is correct, but some are good. And uh, <clears throat> what uh, the speakers are trying to do, or the projects have tried to do, is to include some kind of uh, dynamics into the models. We have seen in the global models now, uh, of Yaza, the migration rates are um, described in terms of, of time. So you can update the model while it, uh, the projection are unfolded. Then, uh, <clears throat> and this ref is reflected then later in the regional and local, uh, say approach to the same model. And actually, um, I like the application of the, say, using machine learning to disaggregate uh, these migration statistics at local level. And this is where, for example, the data discussed in the previous sections may help a lot uh, because they give you auxiliary information to uh, downpin the, the data to very high resolution. So, for example, Meta uh, did uh, the same work that was proposed by, <clears throat> by Lucas by mixing their data which HSL to produce a resolution density maps. Um, then how Dong also uh, discussed the temporal um, component in the in the gravity models. And this is uh, um, it is very important because in my experience and from what was also shown by by Jakub all these time series are not, um, say, stationary. Most migration time series are not stationary. So uh, you need to adapt. You need some kind of adaptivity mechanism in the models to capture the different uh, dynamics. And also, you have to distinguish by different flows. So all this work seems to, to go in this direction. And then in terms of now casting, forecasting, and scenario building, I totally agree with, uh, with Jakub that uh, it's very important, especially when we communicate. When we build the model, we know exactly what we are doing. So we know we are doing now casting model and forecasting model for a scenario um, projection model. The point is how we communicate this to the policymakers if, if we want to have an impact. And it's very important to, to let them know that the limitation of the models was also advantages of using this model in this particular situation. And 
And definitely, yes, we, we need to, I mean, for statisticians or people working econometrics or working with data in general, it's very clear that there is a natural variability in the data that can, you cannot get rid. If you get a forecasting model that does better than the, say, the variance of your data, it's, it, there is something strange in your model. I mean, this is something that cannot happen by the natural behavior of nature, of nature itself. So, <clears throat> and this is very hard to be communicated to policymakers because they want numbers, they want solution uh, to sustain their thesis or eventually to, <laughs> uh, to drive a policy. Um, so I think this is the, the, the common background from the representation that I have understood. I have a few questions, but I think because we are late with the time, maybe let's, I will probably ask, yeah. do the QA okay. asking first the audience if they have questions. Sounds good. Yes. Thank you for all the presentations. Um, I have just, um, uh, I, I want to ask a clarification to um, Lucas, right? Thank you. Um, so I wanted just to ask you uh, if um, I probably got it wrong, uh, but uh, I, I understood the global, uh, the global model, the local model. Uh, you said the regional model are fed both by the global output and the local output or not, because I thought that the local model was fed by the regional output, so I don't know how it can be vice versa. So. might have been a misunderstanding on either my side or you, but like that, it, it is on the regional model is only fed by the global model in addition to like the statistic data from the national institutes where you base like fertility. It's global, uh, regional. Exactly, local. exactly, right. yeah. Clear. And the other question was, uh, um, yeah, in the migration model, in the global uh, model, so that um, you are defining a sort of constant for the uh, return rate, right? Is it mm -hmm. correct? Okay, that's it. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> Another question? Hi, I have a very quest quick question for Hedong. Um, when comparing the models across time and space, basically you've mentioned for I mean, the different uh, models were better for uh, longer panels, but then I realized maybe what I have in mind with long panel is not what you have in mind with long panel. Just wanted to clarify. I wanted you to clarify that because we're not you're not talking about year data across twenty years. I assume, but just wanted to make sure. This, thank you. Um, so th this is uh, kind of. A simple exercise we're just trying to test you know the behavior of, uh, of different uh, models uh, what i mean by long panel it's relative to you know for instance how many uh, covariates you can include uh, in this example we actually use the yearly data uh, but um, the specification of the model is very constrained we actually discussed this in the paper that uh, you know we have a, a very simple form of gravity model and so that we can split the data from 10 to uh, 12 years to show this exercise. But the implication is we see a trend of when the, when the data, when the training data becomes longer, the, 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 the prediction uh, errors uh, drops, even goes below you know, the, the fixed effects model. So that, that's the key insights. Now, um, what I was talking about the implication is uh, for instance, in, in, in Stefano, uh, in, in their scientific reports uh, model, they use high frequency data. Was we weekly? Yeah, so weekly. So in, in that context, you really have a long time series, right? And uh, therefore, I think, uh, like uh, Stefano just mentioned, uh, seems a time series kind of analysis for each individual uh, diet flows would generate uh, some insights in which. Uh, fixed effects model doesn't really offer you because um, basically see a kind of a universal uh, response uh, to, to different factors. Yeah, I had a, a question for uh, Lucas Kluge and a global model as well. Um, in one of, the, one of the parameters that enter the model was the, the GDP. And I was wondering if you had tried other types of indicators because GDP is one of these traditional indicators that has a lot of issues and doesn't really 
correlate with like the well-being of a population. I was thinking more in terms of um, inequality indicators or the size of the informal economy or uh, unemployment, job searches, and so on. Whether you had tried those in, in the model? We did try other um, indicators. So I was staying for some time at Yaza and I think they developed something like years of good living, something like that. So we tried that, which um, also includes more than just GDP. Um, in the end, those models didn't really make it into the final reports just because it's significantly easier to make GDP's projection and to tweak all of these time series and communicate that. Um, what we did in the model that is that I just showed is we have the wages that are not entirely based on GDP. So there's like average years of schooling and the kind of return that you get for education, um, which is also necessary to differentiate between different skill levels. So it's not purely GDP, but it is fairly close. <laughs> Yes, may I, I, uh, may I just respond to Stefano's excellent point about uh, non-stationarity. Thank you for mentioning that, because I think it really goes uh, hand in hand with the communication question. And there, there is a there is a uh, cautionary tale from uh, around the time when the EU was about to expand in 2004. In the United Kingdom, the Home Office commissioned a, a forecasting uh, report, which concluded that um, sort of we can expect about five to maybe thirteen thousand people coming yearly from the new member states. And you know, that as, as, as you know, this was off by an order by an order of magnitude. Uh, the the problem in the report, as it was, I mean, there were several problems, but one key. Uh, problematic aspect was that it was assuming things continuing as they were, even though there was a huge systemic shift in the European migration uh, as it as it was coming. Uh, it wasn't acknowledged at the time. So non-stationarity, the fact that things in migration, uh, things change on the time, equilibria change all the time. It's a very volatile, very dynamic uh, system that is very prone to, 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 to shocks and interventions. This is something that somehow has to find its way both uh, to the models that we do, which is, which is part of the reason for the work we did in, in quantum, as well as for the communication, uh, which possibly is an even greater challenge. Thank you very much. So thanks, thanks again for, for mentioning that. Yeah, thank you, Jakub. So let me wrap up and maybe add a bit of just uh, what was just said. Um, yeah, a couple of things. When, I, when I'm saying model must be adaptive is because uh, thinking about the non-stationarity of, of, the, of the models, when you have, say, long time series, uh, it's not worth to look too much into the past because it is will uh, bias the, uh, say the training of the model and give you completely unreliable results for, for the future. So adaptivity means that for each flows and for each type of say migration you are looking at, you need to adapt the length of the training set, so to speak, uh, in a way that you can capture this instability, change of variance and things like that. I cannot talk on behalf of Umberto from GRC, but they are experimenting something like this uh, already, um, and it seems to work uh, quite well to capture non-stationarity. And then I have a question for, for Lucas, because I think it's relevant, especially because you analyze Italy, for example, which, which is a country I know very well. So my question is, the say the, the salary ratio. So these kind of indicators are brought from the uh, say global model into the probably regional model, but then when you go at the local level, do they update or you just project those to the regional level? The, the weight ratios? Yeah, or like, um... yeah the weight I mean, the, the such economic variable is close to what uh, Alejandra was asking. Those economic variables or indicators that we use for the global model remain in the global model. They are not transferred okay. further on. So um, the regional model is based on these rates based on statistical data on fertility mortality 
And then again, those data is also not um, forwarded to the, to the local level. So all the indicators stay within the spatial scale. Meaning that maybe a suggestion is that in the, when you do the machine learning at high resolution, you can add other socioeconomic variable that may be available at local level. Maybe yeah, already I, do I think this. somebody <laughs> might be interested in the back there. Too. <laughs> but yeah, thanks. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, that's it in terms of my, oh, maybe one comment for you, uh, how long? <laughs> of course, you have two short time series, like 10 years or, I mean, 10 data that you try to, if I understand correctly, to, to, to interpolate into months, monthly data, or at least you, this is something you can do. So try to interpolate, but, I mean, like they, they are doing global to local with machine learning, yeah. geographically, you can do also with time series. You can increase artificially, you can do data augmentation oh. to increase the, 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 the length of the train set. Um, so my question to you is, in, in the last plot that, that you show about the mean square error, this is aggregated figure or many flows that you analyzed? This is aggregated, yes. So meaning that for some flows, maybe there is uh, yeah, the possibility yeah. that for some of them, shorter time series even work better because yeah. they're more irregular than longer time series. Yeah, for sure. Okay. It's, uh, it, it could be certainly a variation across uh, across the flows. Uh, we, we, we can check. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So thank you, everyone.